Welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Mary Ann Hensley and I am the Vice President of Media Operations here at American Shipper and we are happy to present today's webinar in partnership with Thomson Reuters. Today we're going to be exploring the state of global trade amid the abundance of regulatory change we're experiencing today and I'm excited to be joined by three experts in this area who will be sharing their insights and experiences. First is Kevin Shoemaker, Head of Sales for Thomson Reuters followed by Michael Hildebrand, Global Trade Leader in Indirect Tax for the U.S. West Region with EY, and Steve Ellett, Senior Vice President of Supply Chain Design for Chainalytics. They'll also be joining us for a live audience Q&A following the presentation, so make sure to have your questions ready for them. Just a quick couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First, if you have any technical issues throughout the webinar, please click the chat icon in your Zoom control panel and you can address our team directly. And second, for those questions that you have for our speakers, please enter those by clicking on the Q&A icon in your control panel and we will answer as many of those as we have time for following the presentation. At this point, I will go ahead and turn it over to Kevin. Well, thank you, Marianne, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, it's it's good to be with everybody, especially at the end of the year. I thought when we scheduled this webinar that because we were approaching the end of the year and going into the holidays that this was going to be somewhat of a slow period of time. But um, if you've been paying attention to this week, um, I think Donald Trump had a different uh, opinion as to how slow or how fast we should be going into the end of the year considering the things that have gone on this week alone. Um, what we're going to be focusing on uh, during the webinar, it, it strikes right at home and when it comes to, you know, the issues that have been have been going back and forth between the U.S. and China in particular since the Trump administration um, in 2016, which started with the 232 list and the three, Section 301. Um, I'm in London this week, so obviously Brexit continues to be a hot topic. Um, when and if it may occur um, to be determined, but it's still top of mind with everybody over here. Um, so even this week alone, and, and again, this is kind of you know the main reason why we're on the, on, on, on the webinar today, and what we're speaking about is is the continual back and forth. And I don't know about everybody else, but I, I personally have a little bit of whiplash this year from the back and forth, whether or not it's you know China. Um, retaliating against us, or it's Trump as of this week now tweeting out that phase one may be delayed once again going into 2020, uh, 20 for, um, potentially, um, as well as Trump's decision today, or earlier this week, I should say, to announce the tariff increases uh, on imports from France, as well as imports, uh, tariff increases on steel and aluminum imports from Brazil and Argentina. Um, and again, that's just in the last four days. And they, it, that kind of is a great indicator of what we've all been through the last couple of years and especially this year in particular uh, with the constant change and the constant uncertainty of what's going to happen next and what's the next shoe that's going to fall for all of us. Um, and I think this year for, for myself and I think for many of us on this call, um, it was kind of the, um, the inflection point year, in my opinion, where in 2016 when, when Trump decided to, you know, to start the trade war with China and, and in a sense expand it from there, uh, we all thought at that point in time that it was going to be temporary, that we could weather the storm, um, and that too shall pass. But here we are now in 2019, and it not only has it not passed, but it looks like it may be picking up speed going into, into 2020, especially now, even today, that France and EU have now come back and threatened retaliatory tariffs in response to, to Trump's um, uh, announcing the, the tariff increase. So what that's, what that's meant, especially in, in, in my world, and I've been in global trade compliance now for 11 years, and um, what, what, what that has meant for us in particular is global trade, in this case tariffs, coming to the forefront and becoming more strategic in nature, more strategic in the conversations uh, within organizations, and, and global trade now becoming part of those conversations with the supply chain departments, with the logistics departments when it comes to how do we react and how do we respond to the tariffs. Um, and what do we do about it? And again, that's why we're on the call today. And we've got two esteemed uh, experts in their respected fields and, and Mike and Steve to kind of walk us through the challenges, what the challenges um, present, um, how you should respond um, in multiple ways. And, and I'll let Mike and Steve take it uh, from there. But again, that's why we're here is because again, companies now have, not, have kind of, as I mentioned, have come to the conclusion that you can no longer sit on the sidelines that um, 
you know, these the tariff situation in particular um, has has impacted and is impacting your supply chain. It's impacting the bottom line, um, and now you're at a point where I can't I can't wait any longer. I have to start making decisions. And those decisions, you know, are, are multiple, which we'll cover today. I mean, they could be simply pushing the cost back to the supplier, which many which many importers are doing today. You can increase inventory. You could raise prices to the consumer, which hasn't trickled down to the consumer fully yet. But it, you know, again, the longer this continues, the longer companies are going to have to pass that cost along. Um, and for us in the trade compliance space, you know, it's, it's increased interest in solutions like free trade agreements, in particular for trade zones, which solutions which help you mitigate or avoid those tariff increases altogether. So again, those are the, you know, that's what's kind of the driving force, obviously, um, if you've been paying any attention, which I assume you are, which is why you're on, on the webinar, um, and it's what we're going to be discussing today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mike. Uh, oh, first, excuse me, first what we need to do is cover the agenda. Um, that Mike and Steve are going to cover. So first, Mike is going to cover uh, in his first part of the presentation the current state of trade and its impact, um, and then he's going to turn it over to Steve, who's going to cover you know the consider how do you consider global regulatory costs and, and supply chain network design, which to be honest with you, I'm I'm very excited about because this is an area that uh, in the trade compliance world in particular we've been we've been talking about for some years some some time now for a few years now. There's something that companies need to look at, but a, a, it was never strategic enough, and, and again, now that we find ourselves in a situation where in 2019, again, as I mentioned, it's now got a significant financial impact to the organizations, and, and it's now finally come to the forefront, so I'm really excited to hear what Steve has to say. Um, and then uh, Mike is going to conclude with um, some, some thoughts on how executing trade strategies to lower overall spend. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Sounds great. Thanks, Kevin, and thank you again, Thomson Reuters American Shipping, for being invited back to speak. So I guess probably the easiest way to start a discussion on current state of trade impact, I'll come up with some buzzwords hopefully in the next couple of slides, but wow is probably the first word that comes to mind. I think as Kevin teased that pretty nice for us, significant trade disruption continues. I, one can't help but just look at the news, the various alerts, and to be honest, even Twitter. I mean, could you ever have imagined that your day, that your day would begin by looking at Twitter or that would be making supply chain decisions based on a tweet? So anyway, we can definitely spend a lot of time analyzing the uh, method of delivery of some of that terminology and advice, but we'll, we'll see how it kind of continues to play out. But it's an amazing, amazing time right now. Um, I was asked to spend a few moments to just catch us all up. So basically lay the, lay, lay the foundation for what's all happening. As you can tell, it, it changes sometimes by the minute, by the hour, um, and a lot of this happened this week. So if, if you don't or have not kept up this past week, by all means, please do not feel bad. I will try my best to, uh, to, to, to make sure that you're up to speed on some of this. Just realize that tomorrow it may change even more. But let's kind of remember a couple of things. I think Kevin, uh, again, demonstrated very nicely a couple of the buzzwords that we're all encountering and I'll couple, uh, cover a couple of these in the next few next few slides. But the release of the North American Free Trade Agreement text, otherwise known as USMCA, and I'm very familiar with the, uh, with the, <laughs> the, the song that's come out about YMCA about this, so please uh, appreciate the joke in that one. The continued Brexit uncertainty, material sanctions on companies, countries and persons in Russia, China, Iran, the imposition of duties under Section 301 by the U.S. on the Chinese origin goods and subsequent Chinese retaliatory duties are just some of the many disrupting issues at the forefront of global trade discussions. Of these, not surprisingly, the 301 in China dominate most of our conversations based on the significance of the impact and the widespread nature of the industries on this call that are probably affected by it. The next thing I want to say is just remember it's political. If that's one thing you take away from this, all of this is very, very political. And we kind of need to take one step back. You know, the overall U.S. government's dissatisfaction with some of the results of traditional mechanisms to address unfair trade practices has really led us to rarely used approaches in an effort to protect domestic manufacturers, industries, technology, and national security. Uh, the three things that Kevin even mentioned, you know, Section 201, the solar cells and large residential machines, the Section 301 for 25, 30 percent additional duties on a variety of Chinese origin goods, 232, the steel and aluminum. The one thing that you'll note on all of those, if you go back to the beginning, all those came about between the time period of 1962 and 1974. So reminder, these are not new. They're probably new for a lot of us in this generational aspect, but they are not new programs. They're just adapted to the current state. 
But really the sustained month to month release of these new measures have further convinced, I'd say sea levels and, and global trade professionals like us, that trade disruption will not subside in the short run, but rather that uncertainty will characterize the foreseeable future for us all. So again, trade is hot. I mean, it is hot. It is all over the news. When you look at how this all started two years ago with the president's trade policy agenda, it had five major pillars. The first pillar was to support national security, then the strength of the American economy, the basic premise to try to bring jobs back, negotiate tr tr uh, trade deals that would work for all Americans, hence the USMCA update, enforcing trade laws, and then just strengthening the trading system overall. So that's a big buildup to just the five things I have on the slide. So let's spend a few moments and then uh, make sure that we're all up to speed on the items that are noted here. So China, Wow, China all began with this perceived trade imbalance. So the IPR or intellectual property shakedown, jobs leaving the US, goods that were made in China and coming to the US would be taxed and ultimately China retaliated as well. I think there was a comment last week that, the, that Kevin noted and we've seen in the news this week that an agreement has been reached, but as we will see how long until formal resolution and then more importantly, how does one unravel where we are today? The rollback of the $360 billion worth of value, and this is not associated with the rollback commercials that you see on Walmart, a completely different type of rollback. But news about the U.S.-China deal this week is even affecting Wall Street, and I think um, once again this raises the questions about the real progress to negotiate the phase one deal. Uh, the president spoke in London this week and said a China trade deal depends on whether he wants to make it or not. Trump was very clear that he is in absolutely no hurry, no deadline. And in some ways, I think that waiting until after the election um, would be when the China deal may come back in a full play or full negotiation. But it's this kind of tough talk, I think, that's intended to increase the pressure, or at least bring China to the table to have some of these talks. Uh, the other thing is, you know, does this give us some insight in President's you know, economic policy? You know, most Americans think that tariffs are good, so and that they're going to be here for a while. So we'll see how this continues to play out. But I will say one note is, is kind of if you look in a crystal ball a little bit, but you know, one thing I think a lot of people have, if they've wanted to look into some of these trade acts, especially the one from 1974, but the USTR does publish an annual report and it identifies US trade partners that provide inadequate protection on US IPR. And this report comes out every April, I believe. But an investigation may lead to country specific, additional countries under that 301 investigation to determine whether certain trade measures are appropriate. Um, as of the one that came out in April of this past year, 36 additional countries have been identified. And if you look at that, there's two lists, a prior priority list and a watch list. So it's very interesting to see what countries may be next on this 301 issue beyond strictly China. Okay, everyone's educated and brought up to speed on China at this point. Uh, and I'll come back because I've got some more slides on China too. But basically USMCA, you know, um, Pelosi actually said that, uh, Ms. Pelosi said she wants to do something before the year end around USMCA. Uh, but I will tell you the labor associations have been lobbying pretty hard because of the concerns over that minimum pay for Mexico workers, which is a lot of you know is $16 per hour. Um, I think it's very prevalent to know Mexico and Canada economies are suffering until something is ratified. And they're suffering really just because foreign investments have been put on hold. So a lot of the investments they depend on. So especially in light of the China 301, they thought manufacturing, more manufacturing might move to some of these countries, but a lot of that investment has been stalled or delayed until some type of ratification around the USMCA. Brexit, wow, Kevin, I'd love for you to tell me exactly what's going on for Brexit. I don't even know what to say about Brexit other than two things. January 31st, and it's supposed to be a hard Brexit. So I guess a lot will be told between now and then, but the date does keep moving. But technically, we're told that the UK will break apart from the EU at that point. Two things that I think is kind of interesting that, that I want to, that probably may not be in a lot of people's radars, but I think when you think about the trade environment as kind of like a puzzle, and all these various pieces of the puzzle come together, they interact, or, or they may not click exactly, but when you start looking at them in isolation and then look at them collectively, it's amazing how one kind of feeds off the other. So one thing I think I threw on here because I've, I've been fascinating to watch and, and it actually has origins back in the 2004 on the WTO challenge, but this US EU, especially around the Boeing Airbus uh, controversy, but remember EU was providing or there was alleged EU providing subsidies to Airbus and the perception of Boeing receiving subs subsidies from the US government. And this does continue to play out. Uh, in April, the USDR announced preliminary 301 duties on EU under Airbus subsidy. Um, EU challenged the amount. In July, US proposed to 
proposed to proposed to impose an additional four billion on tariffs of imports from the EU. Um, excuse me, August, they reached an agreement with the European Union that allow expansion for duty-free exports of beef from the EU for the next seven years. Uh, but recently in September, the WTO notified the US of its findings in favor of the US, duties up to $7.5 billion annually. So it's interesting, even as of October, the US began collecting duties, 10% on aircraft and aircraft parts, 25% on all other goods. But uh, my point in, in mentioning this, it will be fascinating just to watch as this continues to play out, especially with Brexit in line, especially with China 301, how this whole arena kind of continues to level set. Two last things on this slide, I promise. Japan, Korea, I probably would not have normally put this on here, but I thought it's been another area. Normally, this is a very quiet area in the world, but sensitivity around Japan imposing export restrictions on technology products has kind of woken this area up to some trading sensitivities. If you read some of the press around this area, it does go far back in time, but it is interesting that some of the measures they're using to bring this back up to current state um, are, are very well uh, sound in, in previous history and, and types of issues. One more thing to add, and you know what, these slides were done just on the exact same day, but anybody remember how Tuesday of this week began for us? Kevin kind of teased us or took away my thunder, but a USTR did invest, the USTR investigation concluded that the French tax on digital services does discriminate against US companies. Uh, those US companies specifically noted were Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. So in essence, the US will impose duties of up to 100% on products of France. If you haven't bought your cheese, champagne, cosmetics, kitchen hardware, and tableware, it's probably about time that you do. It was stated that the French, France's digital services tax is unreasonable or discriminatory, discriminatory and does burden or restricts US commerce. The overall retaliation will cover about $2.4 billion of imports from France. Okay, let's go back. So one, one thing is I, as I, it's worth noting that as I've set the trade landscape for our discussion today, kind of where we were, I do wanna go back and focus on, on China for a few moments because there are several things that are worth noting. Uh, first, and, and not too much of a surprise, but 301 and China dominate, as I said, most of our conversations today. Uh, not only just because of the visibility, the amount of trade that goes back and forth between the countries, even the components that may come out of China and go to different countries that make ultimately a lot of the products that, that we use for ourselves. But based on the significance and widespread nature of the industries affected, but when you look at this journey, so you read the slide from left to right, then right to left, so just kind of follow like one of those um, puzzles that we used to do as kids. But there's a couple of things that always jump out at me when I see it in this type. It, it's very quick to see that all of this began only two years ago. So whoever has said the government doesn't work fast has not been in trade at all. And when you spend time looking at the products on the various lists, so everybody should know that there's three lists. The fourth list has actually been split into 4A and 4B, but there are various lists you can't help but conclude they're obviously political in nature. Uh, more recently, this U.S. list four that people are, are very wound up about, uh, this is a 10% additional tariff on the $265 billion of imports. Uh, I told you about the two lists that have separated and rolled out on dates back in October and then also in December for next week. Uh, so you can kind of see the journey that's, that, that's gone through this, especially for the U.S. coming up with list one, two, and three. And then more importantly, when China inserted itself and retaliated, but you can kind of, uh, I, I, for me, it's a very good picture and a, of, a, of a journey that a lot of companies have seen between the two countries. Okay, I had to at least include a tweet. So please laugh, chuckle, enjoy this. Uh, but I did have to bring in a copy of a Twitter site so we can remind us of how we, of how we a lot of us get our news these days. But a couple of comments on some recent actions. So I, I, you know, kind of going full circle and again, kind of knowing where we are today. As recently as October, the US uh, and the Chinese Vice Premier that the two nations had reached initial accord. And as Kevin noted, this also referred to as the phase one agreement. Don't ask me how many phases, I've heard three. Someone told me yesterday there could be four, but right now we're, talk, talk, we're talking about a focus just on a phase one agreement. Uh, they did a joint press conference in the White House the following week, long negotiations, and the agreement will be the first step towards a more comprehensive trade agreement. Uh, 
a couple of things, as I noted, they, they teased about a phase two, phase three, just so they could get something in place at some point. Limited information, but what we have been able to glean from it, the U.S. does agree to suspend the October 15th scheduled increase of the list one, two, and three once the agreement is finalized. Uh, China agrees to increase U.S. agricultural purchases over the next two years. A third thing, China agrees to open up markets to U.S. financial services firm. Uh, fourth, China agrees to concessions regarding currency manipulation. And I think there were some unspecified but limited concessions around technology transfers. But both parties agreed to establish the formal enforcement and escalation. For me personally, I thought was more interesting what was absent from this deal. So for those that have not read it on a Saturday night to make sure that you sleep well, some interesting things that were not noted in this were any type of relief regarding the US sanctions on Huawei. Uh, the 10% reduction on existing tariffs currently in place on both sides. And there were also specific concerns that were silent on regarding technology transfers as outlined in the original Section 301 report. Additionally, the three, the Phase 1 agreement is very silent on Chinese human rights violations and abuses, which were important issues to the U.S. and the October 7th actions that came out of the Department of Commerce, BIS, uh, adding when they added the 28, I think it was, Chinese organizations to the entity list. Okay, an example, math person, accounting person, I love math. So what I like to do is just kind of remind how this escalates very, very quickly and what the impact of some of these Chinese tariffs are. A lot of you might say that we have not felt the impact and that's true, I totally agree with you. I probably personally and, and what I'm shopping for for Christmas, I, I have not seen it directly yet, but I promise you that companies have. Uh, remember the reminder about how fast things have changed. Uh, you can see very quickly the escalation and the compounding does, does go very quickly. The obvious calls that we get or that I get personally was, A, how, do, how can I get out of this and not have to pay it, which I, I, I laugh. Uh, number two, can I absorb this into my general ledger as part of the cost of goods sold? I haven't even budgeted for it. Can I strictly pass on this cost? I think it was interesting a couple of weeks ago, uh, Target, uh, came out to say that notified their suppliers and vendors if they sourced their products from China and the products are on the 301 list, they could not pass through that cost to Target. So it will be interesting to see if Walmart and some others, uh, how they assess that as well. But if you look at the example, a piece of luggage, I try to keep it very simple, but an import value of $100 before all the China drama, drama carried a normal duty rate of 17.6%. It was subject to the list three, so an additional duty of 10%, and then an upward adjustment of 25%, which brings it to about 42.6%. So keeping it simple, a $100 suitcase imported to the U.S. now carries an additional tax burden of $42.60. So hopefully when you look at it quite simply in this context, the question should be how long can this sustain? And more importantly, hopefully you can see the frustrations that a lot of companies were having. I've seen a lot of companies struggle with just, you know, when you start your year and you know what you put in for duty spend or additional costs, remember that for a number of industries that may not have paid duty that now have this obligation, didn't even include this type of cost in their budgeting. So it's been a very, very interesting um, you know, landscape for them to try to figure out how to pull money out of different areas and pull it to this area. Okay, so the obvious question is I kind of teased you a little bit with was, you know, how can I get out of it? Um, <laughs> and this is kind of a loose way of saying there is a process around exclusion. So there's an exclusion actually process on both sides. So US has an exclusion request and so does China. And if you're really bored on a Saturday night, all this is open for public record. And there are some very interesting, fascinating, engaging arguments for exclusions that I know a lot of you will, will, will enjoy. But if you think you have a solid argument, you need to demonstrate that you've got a financial burden, uh, that the only sourcing option for your product is China. And you'll need to demonstrate whether it is related to that Made in China 2025 program. I think if you're a numbers person, you'll see pretty quickly when you look at the chart on the right-hand side, as of November 12th, the odds are low. Only 33.8% of those products or those applications submitted for exclusion on list one uh, were granted. You know, so that means 67 or 66% were actually denied. Uh, some of your odds go up a little bit on list two, and they're still in the process of processing list three and list four. But a number of my clients take the position of why not apply, especially if my C-level or leadership are saying, just at least try, see if you've got a good argument for it. 
Uh, so I will say that, you know, whether you, you meet all those three criteria, I have a number of clients that, that said, I just, I still have to try for the exclusion based on our dependency for those particular components or that particular manufacturing fact pattern. The only reminder I'll say on this slide is list four, uh, you have until January 31st to submit any, submit any exclusion requests. My final slides before I pass it on to Steve. So, so with all of this that we've talked about truly have an impact on companies, the short answer is you bet. I mean, you can't help but see in various aspects. And if you're part of this corporate discussions and then in specific in, into the weeds of some of the trade environment, you will definitely see where the impacts. But let's look at a few of these. So market access, you know, the tariffs raise costs, plain and simple. Uh, the challenge these days is how can we pay for it or how can we pass it on? And I think that's where a lot of companies are trying to balance that spectrum of I can incur the cost only up to a point, trying to gauge or, or play a get betting game of saying the, the regulations may change or that my customers will be willing to accept the pass through cost, but or the pendulum would go the other direction of, you know, I'm just looking at my contractual agreements when I originally had them set up and how do I pass them forward and just give them, um, you know, pass that cost on to them. Uh, the supply chain, you know, the costs, the increased costs for working around sourcing options. I have actually been very, very impressed with how companies in certain sectors have really been able to lift and shift. Um, I know other companies in certain sectors have struggled with this, especially when you have own manufacturing in certain countries and lockdown on sourcing and, and, and type of supply lanes. But I have been impressed, especially in certain sectors that rely heavily on contract manufacturers where, we, where they've been able to move, lift and shift manufacturing lanes, uh, manufacturing um, you know, environments uh, very easily to try to anticipate. And then the classic example obviously is, you know, still sourcing from China, but manufacture, you know, source your components from China, but manufacture the finished product or assemble the finished product into a new, new character device in a different country. The final thing is investment, um, well, mitigation strategies, but investment, you know, recent numbers show that this has actually decreased. Uh, companies are very hesitant, as even I noted in Mexico and the U.S. earlier in the slide deck, but are very hesitant about how and where to invest and, and really what's the ROI. You know, an article I saw in the UNCTAD magazine from June said world investment, uh, global foreign direct investment. So you may see this acronym FDI, foreign direct investment and trade concerns showed investment continuing to drop from its peak in 2015. Uh, the study looked at developed and developing economies as well as economies in transition. So I think one, one fascinating area has just been even the hesitation by US multinationals, global multinationals to still be very hesitant or shy um, about where to put and, and invest some of its money within these type of in, you know, frustrations or disruption. Uh, my last comment on mitigation strategies, all of these have made it very difficult for clients to do business globally. I think that's, that's very simple. And then after, after Steve presents, I'll spend a few moments at the end of the presentation reminding you what some of the other companies are doing in this particular area. Steve? Absolutely. Let me get my uh, slide going here. So thanks, Mike, and uh, thanks to Kevin and Marianne for uh, the invitation as well. Happy to be here. So I'm Steve Eld. I lead the supply chain design practice at Chainalytics. I've been focused on supply chain design for about the last 25 years, about the last 18 at Chainalytics. If you're not familiar with Chainalytics, we're about a 200-person uh, consulting firm focusing on supply chain design and related supply chain issues for, for global and multinational clients. So our focus has been on supply chain design from the start, but we pushed from there kind of up into strategic alignment and cost of service issues and pushed down from there into tactical and operations and packaging delivery models. We do consulting work. We do ongoing engagement through managed analytics doing these kinds of functions like supply chain design uh, in conjunction with companies on an ongoing basis, as well as manage uh, market and intelligence uh, performance and, and benchmarking uh, consortiums for various things. So that's what we do, quick introduction. Let me take a small step backwards into supply chain modeling where it came from. Some of us on the call may not be too familiar with the state of where we are, where we came from. So supply chain modeling it's, let's say it started two, three decades ago, and it was simple, where should I put distribution centers, right? It started with just that basic question, putting them in the right place, balancing 
uh, balancing the cost and, and service to some extent, but mostly minimizing cost. Fast forward to today, we do an awful lot more with it now. Similar technology, similar math problems, but we're getting into things like line level manufacturing, in-source out de outsource decisions, selecting suppliers, all the way down into the into the weeds, including uh, tax and tariff and duty and those kinds of questions. So it's an awful lot more complex than it was many years ago, and we're definitely taking a look you know, far beyond just distribution uh, network design. And, you know, along those lines, it was common years ago to just look at supply chain design kinds of questions very periodically, right? This chart on the left sort of shows that this is what it looked like. You did a bunch of effort. You got a consulting firm, or some software, a bunch of data together. You did a study, and then you implemented that results of that study and opened and closed buildings and made changes for, you know, 24 months, 36 months, something like that, then it was time to do it again as things changed and your network kind of atrophied away from optimal. But these days things are changing much more quickly than they were then, right? Labor markets are changing, fuel cost, service expectations, lots of mergers and acquisitions or potential mergers and acquisitions to be evaluated. Obviously, the topic of today, tariffs and regulatory costs, all those things are changing much more rapidly than they were in the past. And so it's becoming much more common to do supply chain planning, supply chain design on a continuous basis. So it still has this spike in effort to create this modeling environment, to pull this data together and create the hooks into different data sources. But then it becomes more of a steady state. It becomes more of a, a continuous process to look at these things uh, routinely. And that's really where we are now. Many companies have this capability, and the idea is to, to compress the timeline down so to do this more frequently, right? It changed from every few years to kind of periodic, might be quarterly, might be monthly, might be ad hoc, depending on what the requirements are. But to have a model that is trusted, that's up to date, that the team believes, has confidence in, and is used on an ongoing basis. So this idea of a trusted live model that becomes a single source of truth is really where we want to get to. And it's important that it includes all of the relevant costs, including tariffs and regulatory costs. Those are some of the many cost inputs that we have to get right in order for this culture of modeling to work, right? For the people in the organization to believe it and for it to be effective. So that's, that's our approach is we want to uh, make sure that we're addressing supply chain problems, but addressing them holistically, including some of the issues that we've talked about today. And so just, just some examples here of kinds of network decisions that are affected by regulatory costs. I mean, obviously sourcing is, is, is obvious. We've talked about that onshore versus offshore decisions, the lift and shift that was discussed earlier, you know, make versus buy, free trade zones. These are common things that we're looking at within these supply chain design models. Some uh, ones that might be lesser understood is transfer pricing. Things, you know, business unit one sells a product to business unit two, what should that price be? Uh, to minimize uh, taxation for reporting purposes, and then mergers and acquisitions. If I'm going to buy a, a company, does that company have operations in an area that I'm going to be subjected to more regulatory costs or less regulatory costs? So that, that becomes an important player. Incentive negotiations is another one. You know, when we're doing supply chain design, uh, many times uh, certain countries or regions within a country or states are providing incentives based upon number of employees that are going to be in those facilities. And that can be impacted as well and have to be traded off against potential regulatory costs. So the, there are many of these. And I think that the key here is that we really want to take a holistic approach when we're looking at these decisions and look at regulatory costs in some detail, um, but make sure that we're also treating them as one of many important costs, right? It doesn't typically make sense to focus too heavily on regulatory costs at the expense of others. Our goal is to create an environment where we can trade off these costs against one another. So it doesn't actually have to be too difficult to consider tariffs and taxes and duties into these uh, decisions. 
It's uh, modern modeling tools like LamaSoft Supply Chain Guru and JDA Supply Chain Strategist make it pretty straightforward to include these costs alongside the other important costs like freight and, and handling and manufacturing costs and those kinds of things that are, <clears throat> that are expected to be in these models. Uh, there are some types of regulatory costs that do become a little more complicated, but we can still model them. Drawback is an example of that. Um, it does require some skill and thought about how to model drawback, which is certainly the, um, you know, if country one is shipping into country two and then country two is then exporting that to country three, um, the tariffs paid by country two, right, the, the stopping point, uh, you can apply to be refunded. Right, so that's the idea. That can be challenging, but not something that uh, can't be overcome, but it's a little bit more complicated. But I think the real issues here are access to the content for these large number of options. When we look at doing supply chain modeling work at scale, we look at many, many thousands of options. The, the purpose of a supply chain design model is to be able to evaluate many different options simultaneously and find the ones that are the minimum cost or the maximum profit that adhere to the set of constraints. And so when we do that, we consider thousands and thousands of options. So when we're populating uh, potential sites or greenfield sites in a model, we need to understand what the cost of operating those sites are. We need to understand what the freight rates are from, some, from each point to each other point that might be shipped to and from. And similarly, we need to understand the tax and duty and tariff implications of all of those combinations of sources and destinations. It's not uncommon to have tens of thousands of combinations, you know, when you start looking at the product type and the origin and the destination. And so you quickly outstrip the ability for a, a subject matter expert at a client or at a consulting firm to be able to just to kind of generate what those changes are, right? You really need access to uh, software or service that provides this up-to-date information, right? So that's that's one of the biggest issues is how do you get that and how do you get that that has confidence and how do you get it that um, not only has the current options and the current known tariffs, but also the ones that are known but just not implemented yet, like the ones we were just talking about. We know that there's potential for some to be implemented in the next several months. You know, how do we get access to that information? So that's, that's key. Many of our clients have these systems internally because they have to have them to pay the tariffs appropriately and to manage them in their systems. Usually though, we find that those are not hooked to the supply chain design process or not hooked very well. So that's, that's an issue and uh, something that we face uh, somewhat routinely. So when we start, you know, looking at, well, what, what should you do? How do you, how do you deal with this? Um, I think the number one thing that we see is a prioritization of regulatory costs over other costs. I think when they're in the news and they're, you're hearing about them, they tend to take priority and there's initiatives that are spun up to say, how do we minimize this tariff expense? And when that's spun up and there's not a modeling environment that has all of the other costs in it, you know, readily available that we're, with confidence, the focus of the organization tends to be too much on how to minimize the tariff cost or the regulatory cost and not as much or not as accurately on, well, what are the other costs that are potentially going to go up or down if I do lift and shift or if I change sourcing in other ways. And so I think that's a that's a big one. And I think the, the, my takeaway here, my suggestion here is to really make sure that there is an end to end uh, supply chain modeling environment, that supply chain design competency, whether it's fully internal or whether it's a composite team built with someone like Chainlytics, but make sure that it's in place and that there's confidence in the team and there's a, there's right hooks to the right data system so that, um, you can react quickly. What we don't want to have is a situation where a tariff's about to change and now we need a three month process to go spin up a new uh, modeling exercise or analytical exercise to go analyze it, right? It's going to happen much sooner than that. So uh, what we need is a trusted environment that exists that has the access to the different data sources and can react more quickly. And that's what, um, you know, we help companies establish. And that, let me talk about the hooks to that trusted content for a section for a second because i think that's 
that's key to confidence, right? It's not just about the models. It's not just about the modeling environment or the people. It's about how do we have confidence in the freight costs that we're putting in. And I, when I talk about freight costs or labor rates or industrial real estate costs or even tariffs and duty, I'm talking about not just what I pay today at my current facilities, but I'm talking about what I potentially would pay at different facilities that I may not operate today. So we would refer to those as candidate locations or potentially greenfield locations. And so how do you develop estimates for operating cost and freight cost and these things for the alternatives in a way that's not biased? And that's a big deal. It's a big deal for tariffs and duties and taxes that we're discussing today, but it's also a big deal for freight and labor and industrial estate. And so getting good sources to content to go alongside the data that you already have, right? You have good data about what you're doing today, and we can put hooks into that data. But some of the hooks that are uh, often overlooked uh, are the hooks to data that doesn't exist historically that we refer collectively to it as design data. So it's data that you don't find in your transaction systems. It's about things that you don't do today, but you want to compare to what you're doing today fairly and not introduce bias into the model. So that's something that to spend some time on. And you know, we're talking about it here related to tariffs, but it applies to lots of other buckets as well. And then the other one that I think is often overlooked, we've spent some time here today talking about how to model things effectively and how to consider things in a decision support framework effectively to be nimble and be able to react. But it's also critical that the supply chain itself is nimble and able to react, right? It wouldn't help very much if we could generate a, a suggestion that says, hey, go change this, this, and this, but the supply chain itself really just can't be changed. You can think about a strategy where uh, we've, we own all of our own buildings, we employ all of our own people in these buildings, we've built the buildings or we have long-term leases on them. Well, the time from a decision to being able to implement that change in that environment is pretty long. So what we want to make sure to test out when we're testing out scenarios are strategies that don't have as long a lead time to incorporate changes. So perhaps a percentage of the building should be 3PL or flexible space, or uh, perhaps we need to be able to look at uh, some, some combination of flex space and own space where there's uh, some much more ability to be nimble and change. I think when we do that, when we test those scenarios, those might not be the lowest cost, right? Those might ha we might pay a premium for that flexibility, but it still might be the right thing to do. So I think one of the takeaways here is that the lowest absolute cost when we're looking at these scenarios might not really be the thing that we want to take forward and implement, right? We might want to fund some of that flexibility and fund some of that nimbleness because we are going to want the ability to react. We aren't going to be able to look in a crystal ball and know what's six months down the road or 12 months down the road. And so factoring into the scenario, some of that flexibility uh, is pretty critical. And so, you know, I think that that's, uh, you know, that's, that's my, my take on how we implement and how we consider uh, regulatory costs and supply chain design. And, and really, it's something we've been doing for an awfully long time, but as was said earlier, it's just becoming more critical now and it's affecting companies now uh, that it might not have affected either at all or to the same degree uh, as it has in the past. So uh, I'm happy to take your questions at the end, and thank you for the time. I'll turn it back to uh, Mike now. Thanks, Kevin. I think if you go one more slide, that'd be great. I'll spend uh, just, just a few minutes so we still allow a little bit of time for, for Q&A, and I've seen a couple of good questions come in that I'm happy to address as well. But on this slide, what, you know, what we're trying to do with this one is just kind of pull everything together. So it's, it's really, so what now with all this information you're armed with and that you have at your disposal, kind of where are, where are we really working towards and what should we be thinking about in the future? So I, I like the slide because it kind of puts in some silos that a lot of us are very familiar with. And some of them you'll you'll roll your eyes and say, already been there, done that. And some of those will be like, we just can't even touch some of those. But I think it reminds us that there are a lot of tools in our toolbox that that we can look at. And, and you know, trade is in this very envious position these days because we've really been elevated to a seat or to a level that we've never, ever had before. And I think it, it all started even when we looked at changing the tax code with uh, Congressman Ryan a few years ago when they were talking about changing the corporate tax rate and the corporate tax rate was gonna include a variable for credits on exports and a non-deductible item for imports. And so all of a sudden 
You had C-levels, CFOs, CAOs that were very interested in what their import values and export values were. So you can see we've been very blessed in a weird sort of way. And I think Kevin noted 11 years and I've been doing this 25 years. So a lot has changed in a short amount of time period. So it's been very fascinating to see some of the old tools that we've had at our disposal that we've been able to adapt and, and be flexible here. So a couple of real quick things on here, just want to bring to everyone's attention. You know, the first one is always, so what are other companies and how should we think about looking at this differently is classification is always a very prominent one. Uh, to be honest with you, I kind of feel like this is somewhat of old news. Um, I think when some of the China 301 stuff and 232 and some others, every first thing everybody did was rush and look at their classifications to see, are they, are they the right classifications? Is there a different or should we be forced to uh, look at a different or a better one or something that, that gives us a little bit more or seeking the binding rulings that support uh, some of the decisions that we make. But we throw in the origin, it's been very fascinating to watch that one. So it's still an example I mentioned earlier that companies are still dependent on maybe sourcing components from China, but doing assembly operations in, in Vietnam. And so now the product is actually made in Vietnam. The interesting thing there is if anybody wants to look, anybody want to take a guess at who the biggest investor in Vietnam is these days? It's actually China. And the US president issued a tweet recently that said he was not happy that uh, the investment and that US companies were moving to Vietnam and the jobs were not coming back to US. So just that simple example I told you earlier about various pieces of the puzzle that kind of one feeds off the other. This is a classic, classic example. But just don't forget the classification and even origin become a very fun. And I think where where, where trade had a seat originally that just says, no, something may not qualify for say a free trade agreement. Uh, a lot of times we as professionals are being asked, what would I need for it to qualify? So instead of looking at trade as a yes or no type of response, we're now seen as kind of a very valuable member to say, how much would have to originate or be assembled in the country to change or confer a different origin? The second area is always, uh, or the third area here is actually on uh, customs value. Uh, so, you know, how do you lower the taxable base on the import transactions? A lot of companies are, are really analyzing moving beyond price paid or payable and say what rolls up into that, that value, uh, especially when you're outside of transaction value. Can I pull out royalties? Can I pull out design? Um, I've seen design bifurcation. I've seen, especially in the high-tech technology industry, where companies have historically paid no duty because a lot of their product, the products are subject to the information technology agreement. And to think they were all of a sudden paid no duty for years and years, and then all of a sudden slapped with a 25% duty. So even though they may not be able to change classification, they may not be able to change origin, I've seen some very creative uh, approaches to uh, examining value and the way that the valuation terminology or valuation determination is done for specific products. Uh, a couple of comments uh, finally would just be around sourcing. You know, sourcing does continue to shift outside of China. Uh, as I noted earlier, I've been very, very impressed with supply chain flexibility. I think more than just a simple step of let's move manufacturing outside of China. A lot of companies are asking the question, if I move it to Mexico and a tweet comes out tomorrow that says we're back to China or that Mexico is, is a focused attention area and we have to move to Argentina, can our supply chain pick up and move pretty easily? So it's that type of thoughtful approach and the way that sourcing patterns are examined to say, if I move manufacturing to Mexico, do I understand what it would take to lift and shift a subsequent time? The final thing I will say before turning it back to Kevin would just be around deferral programs. I think these are often um, kind of a crutch sometimes. A lot of companies either love them or hate them. So such things as foreign trade zones, I think were mentioned earlier, drawback. Uh, the relaxation of drawback from the 2016 have relaxed the rules in the way that we're matching some exports and imports. I've seen some fantastic scenarios um, so from the oil field and oil equipment that uh, are trying to use foreign trade zones to help offset some of those duties for steel and pipe that are coming in by using foreign trade zones. Uh, first sale for export as noted here has kind of reinvigorated in a lot of industries to try to bring some new life to it. So my point is, 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 is a lot of you may say these are old tools in our toolbox. These are some um, items that we've looked at or examined in the past may not be good, but I will say one thing that I have seen a lot of is ROIs are not, um, while they're still big, the ROI has been much lower. So meaning smaller savings drive just as much attention as those huge, large ROIs as well. So I will turn it back to Kevin and then we can take a few Q&A.
Excellent. Well, thank you, Mike, um, and thank you, Steve. I want to thank you both for an excellent overview of the current state that we find ourselves in and also give everybody in the audience some food for thought um, in terms of, A, what they're dealing with, the constant change that we find ourselves in, uh, world that we find ourselves in, as well as what the potential options may be. Um, so, again, thank you both. Um, for walking the audience through in such detail. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for attending. Um, hopefully, you found the information beneficial. And, and, yeah, real quick before we get to Q&A, I do want to make a couple of comments, observations. Is Yeah, Mike, going back to your previous point, is yeah, you've been in, even in this longer than I have, but the the difference in the two worlds is, is absolutely incredible. You know, when I joined, it was, you know, you, melt, you may deal with a, a, a terror schedule on an annual basis, uh, tariff change, uh, tariff change the tariff schedule on an annual basis or a uh, free trade agreement being enacted every now and then and to the world that we find ourselves in now, which um, as you touched on the, a few times and we all are living it, which is tomorrow could change with a, with a tweet, um, which for everybody in the audience, for all of us in, in, in the supply chain and trade compliance space, that means that, and, and Mike, you highlighted in your first slide, which is it's just not one thing. It's a number of things that all of us need to keep up with and try and keep track of that are all impacting our decisions as to, you know, where we're sourcing from, for example, how we're classifying products, um, you know, what is the country of origin of the product, um, what are my other options. So, uh, again, there's a lot of a lot of moving parts to this picture. Um, and for the audience, um, you know, it also reinforces the fact that you can't keep up with it by yourself, and there are, um, you know, there are resources out there available to you, you know, in the form of an Ernst & Young um, that can help you keep up with, the, with a constant and ever-changing regulatory landscape as well as give you, you know, insight and options as to how to respond to a Channelytics um, who allows you to do the modeling and the network design to see what the potential impact of changes in your supply chain is, is any, you know, as a result of the changing tariff or an increase in tariff. Um, and even to a Thomson Reuters One Source Global Trade, which I'm part of, where we provide, you know, the automated solutions um, to help keep you compliant, but more importantly in today's day and world, help you avoid those, those increase in tariffs, whether or not it is, as I mentioned earlier, it's free trade agreements, it's a foreign trade zone, it's any duty referral program for that matter around the globe, um, or even duty drawback, as, as Mike and Steve just both touched on. So, so again, I, it's, it, it's, it's an exciting time, I guess, to put it um, one way in, in, in the trade world. Um, and, again, as we've, we made the point a couple times, is, is it doesn't look like it's going to slow down um, anytime soon, for, for good or for bad. So, with that, with the time remaining, I do want to get a couple of questions. So, I guess I'll ask Steve, uh, question to you first. Um, and, and, Mike, this, you may want to jump uh, in on this question as well, which is, you know, what are the biggest challenges or opportunities that you have seen with this trade disruption in, in the constant state of change? Uh, yeah, let's see. I'll, I'll answer that quickly. I mean, it, we've seen, <clears throat> I think, in a couple of different key cases here, even recently, uh, our clients changing sourcing. I mean, that's just that's the biggest impact. Is things that were, you know, made in in China, as an example. The example I'll recall is a, is a consumer. It's a consumer good. It was a consumer a consumable product, and it was it was made in China, uh, brought to the U.S. And our our study was focused on looking at alternate sources and looking and comparing what some different uh, manufacturing options were in different parts of the world. And it ended up being moved. It was actually moved uh, to Europe in this case. And um, we're seeing that increasingly. Right? It used to be, as we talked about in the beginning, that that some the freight uh, or the labor differential would have dwarfed the tariff implications, and now we're seeing the tariff uh, can kind of take over and it become becoming more and more influential. Yeah, no, I totally agree, Steve. I think one of the other interesting things that is, you know, one thing hopefully the audience has picked up is just how companies have to adapt and be flexible enough to adapt their supply chain to anticipate uh, some of the disruptions and especially not only historical what's happened, but what's going to happen tomorrow, what do we need to prepare for in uh, three months. I think the second thing that obviously has caught a lot of people by surprise was really the the, the China the, the tariffs the additional tariffs on top of and I think you know people forget then in the trade world a tariff is actually an excise tax it's above the line that rolls into the cogs cost of goods sold 
but unlike VAT, it is generally not recoverable. So when most people in your tax groups get so excited about VAT because they usually can get it back through an onward sale or through some type of credit, but customs duty is a sunk cost. So if you have not anticipated some of that, you can see very quickly how those numbers grow, especially in COGS over, over, a, you know, over the time period. So those have probably been the two biggest uh, surprises, challenges. And, and you know, when you think about you know, your household budget, you know, if all of a sudden you have an increase in, a, in an area in your household budget, just like a company, you don't know you have to pull something from one area to cover that in another area and that's just been a, a huge and i think that was very interesting on on target's article a few weeks ago of just saying we're not going to take on the the pass through of the china tariffs you know if you're going to still be and, and probably the big elephant in the room they can leverage those relationships but you know we will not patent take on the additional pass through cost on some of those those the, those tariffs subject to um, you know 301. okay thank you uh, staying with you, Mike, so a question for you. What have been some of the biggest surprises to companies around this trade disruption? And that's an interesting question. Yeah, I think it was funny. It was when when you when this all first started, and again, remember what I said. You know, this all is really just two years ago. So I think probably the first surprise surprise was for a lot of people the administration changed, and then the second surprise was, what is this administration going to really do? And I think um, you know the big elephant in the room was the you know U.S. withdrawal from TPP. Um, then all of a sudden you had. NAFTA bad, let's come up with a new agreement. So we'll come up with something called USMCA, then China is bad, and then all of a sudden this week it's been the French digital services tax. So you can see this, this and I've used the word several times in this discussion today, but this, this journey that the government as well as companies and even ultimately consumers are going through to try to say, or try to get a better perspective on how the trading, trading world is impacting uh, personally, um, economically, politically, and even professionally. So the surprises we've probably already noted, you know, that just the, the, the significant cost that most companies have incurred. Um, but I think at the end of the day, people have become smarter uh, as for some more open discussion. I think trade has been introduced into other areas of the company, maybe they haven't been involved with. And when uh, supply chain has normally seen trade as kind of that necessary evil, meaning you tell us bad, we try to be good, or we were more of a maverick in the supply chain world and trade tries to pull us back. It's been very, very more collaborative in an environment that traditionally is what may seem more adversarial at times. My other only comment I will say is, you know, what's been interesting was just the sea levels perception of this. So uh, for those that have had an introduction into the sea level and been forced to provide numbers very quickly to sea level and the leadership of their companies, it's been fascinating to see them want to learn and want to have more knowledge. Uh, they're being asked for news articles for what is the impact to your company. So they're needing access to data that you own and you control to be able to know some of this. I think a lot of the C-levels have been surprised about really what their global spend is, how much they are manufacturing or depending. I've heard a number say we didn't realize how much we were sourcing from China till all of a sudden a 25% uptick in a particular area was affecting certain costing. So I think that is as a kind of a curse, but also a blessing where companies have been able to see where, um, been able to take advantage of those relationships at, at, at much higher levels. Okay, thank you, Mike. And it looks like we got one more time, uh, time for one more question that I want to squeeze in because it, it's, it's, it's a, a, an important question um, that I think um, everybody needs to, um, to hear from Steve, and it comes down to data. So without, without quality data, without accurate data analysis, um, becomes challenging at best. So Steve, during your portion of the presentation, you, you made a comment about trusted hooks. Um, so I wanted to ask, do you have any comments or observations about companies that are solely dependent on government data sources? And again, we, we also go off of data uh, the source, either the, with the government agency um, or the customs broker to get that entry declaration data. So again, that are solely dependent on government data sources for data because there's a lack of trust and quality of data from our own system or even from brokers or forwarders. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it's common, companies have various opinions, right? And it's common for our clients to have a preferred sources and preferred subject matter experts. Uh, the keys are it's got to be current and it's got to be right and it's got to also have the known changes or the expected, right? It's, it's not enough to have here's what we're paying today, but to the extent that it's known, if there are 
changes that are going to be implemented that are that are known in a month or six weeks or so, that's got to be there too. And I think the bigger issue than the source, I mean, sometimes that's direct from government, sometimes it's through you know software providers and service providers. But the bigger issue, I think, is usually, it's been my experience, that's those data are not connected very well to a supply chain design process. A variety of reasons for that. Some of them might be technical. Some of them just might be organizational that those teams aren't used to it tariffs mattering as much as they do now, and so they're not connected. But I, I think whatever the source of the, of the input is, it's connecting it to the right teams that are making these planning decisions and these sourcing decisions uh, and, and just gaining confidence in the organization around it. Because I think you're you're interacting with people now, who aren't used to dealing with tariffs being as influential as they are now. Okay, very good. So I see we are at the bottom of the hour. So, so Mike and Steve, thank you again. Marianne, I think I'll turn it back to you to to wrap things up. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. And thank you to everyone again for taking the time to listen in as well as of course our partners at Thomson Reuters for partnering with us on today's presentation. We appreciate you guys sharing your insights with us and for being here with us today and hope you'll join us for another webinar again soon. Have a great afternoon.